Alrighty. So in my last lecture, I was attempting to define for all of you what attention is, right? But it turns out that that's a fairly difficult task because there's not a singular attentional system, but rather uh, three different attentional systems, right? And so last time uh, we talked about each of those three types of attention separately. So what I'm gonna talk about in this lecture are, uh, number one, how psychologists attempt to study attention in terms of the um, paradigms and methodology that they use, right? So that's the first objective is how do psychologists scientifically study attention? And then our second objective is going to be talking about uh, different theories that psychologists have posited in terms of um, how the attention system works, right? So we have, for example, um, the modal model, which is a theory that was posited by Atkinson and Schifrin to explain how memory works. Right? So we're going to do something similar here and that we're going to talk about um, various theories that psychologists have um, devised in an attempt to explain how attention works. Um, and the particular type of attention that I'm going to focus on in this lecture is selective attention. So before we get uh, much further, I did want to resolve some potential confusion that you guys might have uh, from my last lecture. Um, and that confusion might arise in trying to distinguish between selective attention and executive attention, right? Because they're very, very similar. Um, so when we talk about selective attention, basically what I mean is an attentional system that, that allows you to focus on one thing, okay, and one thing only, right? So it allows you to focus on or isolate a single stimulus or event while simultaneously ignoring or filtering out everything else in your environment, everything else in your consciousness, whatever it might be. Right? So notice that verbiage there that's very intentional filtering out. Right? So all of the models that we're going to talk about today are models of selective attention that are referred to as filter models. So keep that in mind. Right? But so basically selective attention in terms of uh, keywords, I guess you could say, is more of an orienting attention, right? So it's a system that allows you to orient yourself or focus yourself um, uh, on a particular stimulus in the environment, right? Um, so, the, so the example I gave last time was studying at a busy coffee shop, right? So if you were to employ your selective attention system here, Right? It would allow you to orient or focus on your notes or your textbook or your homework assignment or whatever, you know, whatever academic stuff you're working on. Um, so you would focus on that, but you would ignore, for example, the conversations of all the people around you, the sounds of the espresso machine and so forth. Okay, so you're focusing all of your attentional resources on one thing, uh, while simultaneously ignoring everything else. Okay, let's contrast that with executive attention. So executive, uh, executive attention always occurs at the level of the response, or it always occurs at the level of some action. Okay, so when we employ our executive attention system, what we are doing is we are attempting to stop or suppress what's called a dominant response 
And simultaneously, while we're stopping that dominant response, we're working to start or activate a less dominant but appropriate response. Okay, so when I say dominance in this context, I'm referring to frequency of use, right? So if you're accustomed to making a particular response in a given situation, and you've done that many, many times before, that's going to be your dominant response, right? Because you've used it frequently. You've made that response a lot, right? And we can contrast that with um, a less frequent or less dominant response simply because you haven't executed that response as often, right? Um, so you would employ your executive attention system when for whatever reason it happens to be appropriate for you to employ that less dominant response instead of the more dominant response. Okay, so the two examples I gave were the Stroop effect and the cactus example, right? So with the Stroop effect, right, with that paradigm, with the color words, your dominant or most frequent response when you see a word, right, is to read that word. Everybody except a preschooler, right? knows that when they see a word written out, they should read that word, right? So that's your dominant, well-practiced response. Your less frequent or less dominant response is to, um, is to say the color in which the word is printed, right? Which is what this task requires you to do. Right? So this is the perfect example of executive attention because you have to stop reading the word and instead focus on its color. Right? Make sense? If not, y'all are welcome to uh, send me uh, an email and I can meet with you over Zoom or whatever you like. But hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. Um, the second example, the cactus example. Right, so I gave the example of someone kind of vigorously washing their dishes, right? We're in the middle of the coronavirus ep epidemic. We're all sort of vigorously washing our dishes, right? Um, so you're vigorously washing your dishes and it just so happens you have three plants on your windowsill in your kitchen um, and one of them is a cactus. So uh, throughout the course of washing those dishes, you knock one of them off the windowsill right? Um, and your reflexive or your dominant response in that situation when you knock something over, especially when that something is fragile, right, is to grab it before it falls on the floor, right? So that's your dominant response. But in this particular situation, that would be ill-advised, right? Because if you try to pick up a cactus, you're going to get all those, you know, sharp, um, I don't actually know what they're called, spears or, you know, little prickly things in your hand, um, and that's going to be uh, painful. You guys know I like to drink water. Okay, so that dominant response is going to cause you physical pain, okay? So it's time to activate your executive attention system and suppress that grabbing response in favor of just letting it fall, okay? So that's the uh, distinction between selective attention and executive attention. Um, like I said, hopefully that makes sense and y'all are welcome to reach out to me if you have questions, okay? Okay, so now let's talk about um, the, the first theories that attempted to explain selective attention. So the first psychologist who attempted to formally study attention was Donald Broadbent. So Donald Broadbent was a British psychologist 
who uh, was one of the first people to work in the Applied Cognitive Psychology Center at Cambridge University. Um, and this was during the heart of the uh, information processing era, right? Or the, the time when psychologists were committed to using the computer as a metaphor for the mind. So, so Donald Broadbent was uh, working with um, at the Applied Psycholo Cognitive Psychology Center, um, and one of his main projects at that time was working with the military. Okay. So he worked uh, quite extensively with the British Royal Navy and the particular uh, military personnel that he worked with were air traffic controllers. Right. So for those of you who don't know exactly what an air traffic controller does, basically air traffic controllers are responsible for monitoring um, the position, uh, the speed, um, and the altitude of multiple aircraft. Okay, so at any given time, they're responsible uh, for monitoring the safety of thousands and thousands of planes. Okay? So what they do is, is they obviously they monitor planes um, and obviously if they come to a situation where maybe they need to make an emergency landing or they encounter some kind of an emergency situation, then the air traffic controller is responsible for giving them um, directions for how to make a safe landing, for example. So one of the unique challenges and one of the things that makes the job of an air traffic controller especially difficult okay, is that, again, they're responsible for, for many, many, many different planes, right? And they're receiving all sorts of messages from the pilots of these incoming planes simultaneously, right, over the radio. And they know that they're only able to deal effectively with one message at a time, right? In the middle of all those, all those messages over the radio, they have to decide what is the most important, right? So of these thousands and thousands of pilots that I'm working with, who needs me the most, right? And that's the message that I'm going to attend to first um, so that I can help that person. Right? So um, Donald Broadbent was really intrigued by this, and he wanted to better understand how these air traffic controllers are, number one, able to attend to all this information, but number two, how are they able to choose which message is most important? So in an effort to do this, uh, Broadbent devised a technique called the dichotic listening task. And in this case, dichotic uh, refers to presenting different stimuli to the left and right ears, okay? So you present, for example, one sentence in the left ear and one sentence in the right ear. And the participant's task in this experiment is to focus on the message in one ear called the attended ear and repeat what they hear out loud. Okay, so they have to focus on the message coming in. Right? In this example, uh, it's in the right ear. Okay, um, and they have to repeat back that message verbatim. So you can see the obvious parallels here, right? They have competing messages coming in, one from the left ear, one from the right ear, and they have to ignore the one coming in for the left ear and focus instead on the one coming in the right ear, okay? So again, this task is referred to as shadowing the task where they have to repeat back verbatim whatever they hear in the attended ear, okay? Okay, so that is the task that 
broadbent device to mimic the experience of uh, of air traffic controllers, right? And so this is the paradigm that psychologists use to study selective attention. Okay, so typical results of experiments using this dichotic listening paradigm are that although participants can easily shadow a spoken message, okay, so they can easily repeat back whatever the message is that they hear in the attended ear, okay? So participants can easily shadow a spoken message presented in the attended ear, and they can also report whether the unattended message is spoken by a male or female, okay? but they can't really report much else from the unattended channel, right? So many, many experiments using this dichotic listening paradigm confirmed that people are not aware of most of the information being presented in the unattended ear, right? So it seems like people can relatively easily focus on the message in the attended channel or the attended ear and ignore the message in the unattended ear, right? So like I said, participants are easily able to repeat back 100% of the content they hear in the attended channel, okay? And they hear remarkably little from the unattended channel, right? So for example, they can't tell if uh, in the unattended channel, they hear random words or a coherent message, right? So it doesn't matter if it's gibberish or poetry, they can't tell the difference. Right? They can't tell if the speaker in the unattended ear switches languages. So switching from German to French isn't detected um, by most participants. And similarly, uh, only four out of 30 participants um, noticed uh, passages being read in Czech um, with, or excuse me, pa uh, Czech passages being read in with an English pronunciation. So again, that's just an example of basically gibberish that wouldn't make any sense, right? So people only noticed that it was gibberish, you know, a very, very small percentage of the time or a very small number of participants noticed that it was basically incoherent. Right? And in another case, um, in this particular experiment, participants were presented with the same word 35 times. So it was just repeated over and over and over again. Um, and they were totally unaware of what that word was despite repeated presentations. So again, what this illustrates is we're actually very, very good at focusing on the unattended, on the attended ear and ignoring everything in the unattended ear. Okay. So based on these results, Donald Broadbent created a model of attention that was designed to explain how it was possible to focus on uh, one message and ignore everything else, right? So how does this happen? So how is it that we can focus on a single message and not recognize any of the other information in the unattended channel, right? Well, this was the theory that he proposed. Um, and again, I mentioned that Donald Broadbent uh, worked during the height of the information processing era. So you might notice right away that Broadbent's model is very, very similar to other information processing models we've talked about in this course, um, most notably the modal model, right? So we have sensory memory, for example, represented here. Um, and we also have short-term memory. It just says memory there, but it's meant to be short-term memory, okay? So again, very, very similar um, with uh, the same structural features uh, that uh, Atkinson and Schifrin have in their modal model. Whoops. Okay. 
So our first step uh, in this model is sensory memory, right? So just like uh, it was represented in uh, the Atkinson and Schifrin model, sensory memory is going to hold all of the information in both the attended channel and the unattended channel, okay, for a fraction of a second. So it's going to take in all incoming information, both that which is in the attended channel and the unattended channel, and hold it for a fraction of a second, okay? But keeping in mind that this is a limited capacity system that easily gets overloaded, okay? The next step is a filter, okay? So again, all of the information from the unattended and the attended ear is going to be briefly held in sensory memory and then transferred to the selective filter. Okay. And the task of the filter, okay, the filter is going to identify the message that is being attended and that identification process is going to be based on its physical characteristics, right? So what do I mean by physical characteristics? I mean things like, for example, the speaker's tone of voice. Maybe their um, vocal or tonal pitch, for example, or how quickly they talk or their um, the speed of their speech, um, as well as their accent, okay? So basically any, any um, kind of auditory pieces of information um, are going to be selected by the filter and using these physical characteristics of the speech that they hear, okay, only the unattended mess, or excuse me, only the attended message. So only the information coming through the attended uh, ear is going to pass through the filter um, to what's called the detector, okay? So again, we have sensory memory that briefly holds all information coming in from the attended and unattended uh, ears. Then uh, that information is going to be sent to a filter. And based on the physical characteristics of the speech that's heard, so for example, the speed of the, how, how fast the person is talking, um, that person's accent, and so forth, their tone of voice, right? Whatever auditory information is available, based on those physical characteristics, the uh, information in the attended ear is going to be selected and sent to what's called the detector. And all of the information in the unattended channel or the unattended ear is going to be filtered out, okay? So said differently, what the function of this filter is, is to select the information in the attended ear and filter out all of the information in the unattended ear, okay? So remember, up to this point, all of the information in the attended ear has been processed in terms of its physical characteristics or what it sounds like, right? So now what the detector is going to do, the detector is going to process the information from the attended message, okay? to determine its higher level characteristics. In this case, primarily its meaning, okay? So the detector is responsible for processing the information from the attended channel in terms of meaning.
okay? And because all of the information that's passed through the filter is from the attended channel, okay? Then the, the detector is going to process all of that information in terms of meaning. Okay, so at the very last uh, stage, here we go, the very last stage of, of Broadbent's early selection model, the output from the detector is going to be sent to short-term memory, which we know is going to hold the information for about 10 to 15 seconds, um, and then transfer it to long-term memory where it's held indefinitely. Okay, so basically the primary characteristics of the early selection model is that information from the unattended ear is going to be filtered out before it's processed for meaning. Right? So nothing from the unattended ear is going to get processed for higher level characteristics like meaning. Okay? So that's going to be important in our next in our next uh, uh, in our next series of slides, right? So what we're going to talk about now are some limitations of this early selection model or some problems with this early selection model. Okay, so I mentioned in my last lecture that there is a phenomenon called the cocktail party effect, right? And the way that the cocktail party effect uh, manifests is you're at a party where you're deeply engrossed in conversation with, uh, uh, with friends, right? So you're deeply engrossed in, in conversation. Maybe you're talking about, you know, your plans for spring break or whatever, but you're very, very interested in the conversation. It's, it seems to have captured all of your attention, right? You're, so you're um, very interested in this conversation. Um, and then all of a sudden, from all the way across the room, okay, you hear your name, right? And all of a sudden, even though you are really, really focused on this conversation, right away you snap your head up and look in the direction um, that your name is coming from, right? And what is so compelling about this, right, is that Prior to that point, you were totally focusing on the conversation you were having, right? And filtering out all of the other noise around you, all of the other conversations, the music, what have you. But as soon as you hear your name, suddenly it registers in your attentional system, right? So they've actually demonstrated uh, the cocktail party effect in the laboratory using the dichotic listening task, right? So just like it sounds, they would hear, you know, maybe a, a list of words in the attended ear, right? So they would hear, for example, set, go. Um, and then in the unattended channel, they would also hear uh, a list of random nouns, um, but suddenly they would hear their own name. And what's so interesting about this is that the vast majority or a significant proportion of participants report having heard their name, right? So we just talked about all the different things that, uh, that uh, participants don't notice in the unattended channel. They don't notice whether it's a male or female speaking. They don't notice if, it's, if the language changes, what have you, but they seem to be able to detect information that is um, relevant to them or personally important to them, right? So why is this a problem for Broadbent's early selection model? Well, it's a problem because according to Broadbent's early selection model, right, all of the information from the unattended channel gets filtered out before the detector can process its meaning, right? 
So if that's the case, then people shouldn't be able to detect whether it's their name or not, right? Because it's already been filtered out. Um, but it turns out that people are. People are able to detect their own name. Okay. Similarly, another issue for the early selection model um, was uh, demonstrated in, a, in an experiment by uh, D uh, Don Mackay. And in this experiment, in the in the uh, attended ear, participants heard deliberately ambiguous sentences. So for example, they might hear they were throwing stones at the bank. Okay. In the unattended ear, they either heard river or money. Okay. So obviously this plays into the fact that there are two meanings for a bank, right? One is an institution that, you know, is responsible for keeping all our money. Uh, and the other meaning is, is a river bank, right? Um, so again, so in the attended channel or the attended ear, they heard the sentence. And then in the unattended ear, um, they heard either river or money. And then their, their task uh, later on was to choose which of the following sentences were closest to the meaning of the message that they heard. Right, and you guys can probably guess that, uh, so for example, in one case they heard they threw stones toward the side of the river yesterday, or they threw stones at the Savings and Loan Association yesterday. Right? And you guys can probably guess that uh, people's answers uh, were a direct function of what word they had heard in the unattended channel or the unattended ear, right? So if they heard river, they chose the first option, whereas if they heard money, they chose the second option, right? So again, why is that a problem? It's a problem because according to Broadman's model, right? No higher level processing has taken place for the information in the unattended channel, right? So, so participants are not supposed to have any information about the meaning of the words uh, if the information was presented in the unattended ear, but it looks very convincingly like they do. So um, another very similar experiment that suggests that participants are processing uh, information in the unattended channel uh, for meaning um, was conducted by Gray and Weedburn, okay? And essentially what, um, what this experiment demonstrated, I'm just gonna jump I had one more, oh, actually, no, I'm not. So, so basically in this experiment, in the left ear, they heard, uh, they heard Dear Seven Jane, and in the right ear, they heard Nine Aunt Six, okay? Well, after hearing each of those messages simultaneously, what participants shadowed or what they uh, gave in their, um, so remember their task is to repeat what they hear in the attended channel. Uh, the shadowing report that they gave was Dear Aunt Jane. Okay, so remember in one ear they heard Dear Seven Jane and in another ear they heard Nine Aunt Six. So they decided to combine um, each of those two messages in a way that was coherent and made sense to them, right? So again, this is yet another example um, that very compellingly suggests that they're processing even that unattended channel uh, for some degree of meaning. Okay, one last uh, demonstration for you, very similar type thing. So uh, in the left ear, they hear sitting at the mahogany three possibilities. In the right ear, they hear, let us look at these table with her head, shadowing report. 
sitting at the mahogany table. Okay, so obviously they're getting some higher level processing, both of the unattended channel and the attended channel. Okay, so in light of uh, all of these inconsistencies, um, there was a new model of selective attention that was proposed. Uh, and this model was proposed by Deutsch, Deutsch and Norman. And it was very, very similar to uh, Broadbent's model, uh, but it flipped uh, two of the components. Right? So we still start with sensory memory, which is a limited capacity register that briefly captures all of the information in the attended and unattended channels for a fraction of a second. Right? So that's the same. But next we have that handy dandy detector. Right? So next we have the detector that allows for higher level or meaning-based processing, right? And so that detector is going to take all the incoming information in sensory memory from both the attended channel and the unattended channel and process it for meaning, okay? So after the information has been briefly registered in sensory memory, Okay, and then move to the detector where it's processed for meaning. Then we're going to filter out uh, um, the information in the unattended channel. Okay, so at that point is when the selective filtering takes place. And then only the information in the, uh, in the attended channel is going to be transferred to short term memory. Okay, so again, we're just flipping the places of the detector and the filter so that information from the unattended and attended channels um, can be processed for meaning before it's filtered out. Okay, but there's a kind of obvious flaw with this late selection model, and that obvious flaw is. Uh, it has to do with the concept of cognitive economy. So cognitive economy is a concept that was kind of referenced in the Seven Sins of Memory article, right? So one of the reasons why, for example, transience and absent-mindedness um, are adaptive uh, failures, in quotes, of the memory system are that they prevent us from being inundated with irrelevant information, right? And if we're not inundated with irrelevant information, then we have more processing power or we have more cognitive resources to focus on what is important, right? So, so relatedly, Right? Imagine if you had to spend all of those resources processing everything you hear for meaning, right? Even outside of the context of the uh, dichotic listening um, task, right? That would become very, very arduous if we have to allow for higher level processing of the things we're attending to and the things we're not attending to, okay, that's going to use up a lot of our resources, a lot of, uh, a lot of the uh, time and processing power that we have available as cognitive beings. So it's really not an efficient uh, way of, of uh, using our, our mind, so to speak. So how do we solve this efficiency problem or this cognitive economy problem? So we know that it's not efficient, right? It doesn't preserve our cognitive economy to process everything in the attended channel and everything in the unattended channel. 
right? That's a waste of our resources, so to speak, right? But it's it's reasonable to assume, right, that, that some of the stuff in the unattended channel might be relevant to us right? Or it might be things that we would like to process or we would like to know about, right? So the first model that attempted to preserve this cognitive economy or think about the efficiency of attentional processing was the uh, attention attenuation model. And this was proposed by Anne Treisman. And she was basically operating under that assumption right, that the most efficient attentional uh, system would allow for the possibility that we could uh, notice or attend to information in the unattended channel, right, but that the most noticeable or the, the easiest to detect information in the unattended channel um, should be information that's important to us, right? So let's take a look at uh, this diagram here of Ann Treisman's attention attenuation model, right? So first we, we've got incoming messages, right? So what that means is we've got information coming in from both the unattended channel and the attended channel, right? So that information comes in and that information is registered in what's called the attenuator, right? So information comes in from both the attended channel and the unattended channel, and it registers with the attenuator. And so what the attenuator is going to do is it's going to uh, extract, if you will, three types of information from both the attended channel and the unattended channel or the messages therein, right? So for the messages in the attended and the unattended channel, the attenuator is going to process the information in terms of its physical characteristics, right? So by physical characteristics, I again mean the pitch of the speaker, or is there, do they have a high pitch voice or a low pitch voice? Um, the speaking rate of the speaker, are they speaking uh, quickly or slowly, etc. So all of those auditory characteristics are going to be processed or extracted from both the attended message and the unattended message. Similarly, information in both the attended and unattended channels is going to be processed in terms of their language properties, right? So for example, each word in both channels, right, is gonna be processed in terms of how many syllables it has, right? So how many syllables makes up each of, each of the words and so forth, right? So we've extracted a lot of information. We have physical characteristics or auditory characteristics as well as linguistic characteristics from both channels. Lastly, the attenuator is going to process both the attended message and the unattended message in terms of meaning, right? So we're going to do that full scale um, meaning based or higher level processing uh, for both the attended message and the unattended message, okay? And then from there is kind of the cool thing. So from there, <coughs> Excuse me. Both the attended message and the unattended message are going to pass through the filter, right? So because uh, Ann Treisman's model allows both the attended message and the unattended message to pass through the filter, it's sometimes referred to as the leaky filter model. But what, uh, what happens during this, this uh, phase is the attended message passes through at full strength. 
So by strength, what I mean is basically how loud the message is or how flashy the message is, how easily the message can be detected by our attentional system, right? So if something passes through at full strength, it means it's highly, highly detectable by our attentional system, right? So you imagine it in terms of maybe its amplitude, right? So the attended message passes through at full strength. The unattended message passes through at a much weaker or a much softer, if you will, strength. Okay, so what that means by weaker strength, right, is that it's going to be harder for our attentional system to notice that information. It's not as loud, it's not as flashy, it doesn't make a big fuss, right? Okay, so we've got the attended message at full strength, the uh, unattended message at a much, much weaker amplitude, less flashiness, etc. Okay? Then the next phase of the model um, is what's called the dictionary unit. So the dictionary unit is the mechanism that allows us to decide what information is meaningful or personally relevant to me. So what information do I want to be able to detect even when it's in the unattended channel, okay? So the dictionary unit contains words that are stored in memory, and each of those words is going to be, uh, is going to have rather a threshold for being activated, okay? So a threshold is the smallest signal strength at which a particular word can be detected by the attentional system, right? So therefore, a word with a low threshold would be detected very, very easily, even when it's being presented softly or even when it's obscured by other words, right? So according to Treisman, words that are especially common or that are especially important to the listener have low thresholds so that even when they're given a weak signal in the unattended channel, they can activate our attentional system, right? So if this sounds familiar, right, it should, um, should make you think of the cocktail party effect, right? So obviously our names are very important and very relevant to us. So even when we hear our name in the unattended channel, we're going to be able to detect it very, very easily, even if we're following um, the attended channel very closely, right? Just like if we're at a party and there's all kinds of noise and we're deeply engrossed in a conversation, we're automatically going to notice uh, when our name is called because of that low threshold, right? So items that are, are personally significant to us have low activation thresholds so that even when they're, uh, when they're in the unattended channel or even when they have very, very weak signal strength, we're still able to detect them, right? And the uh, converse is also true. Uh, so words that are very, very low frequency or words that we don't encounter very often and therefore don't need to be able to detect, right, um, are going to have very, very high thresholds um, because we don't, we don't need to have them, we don't need to activate them or we don't need to have an attentional system that preferentially detects them regardless of, of strength, right? So, so personal words that are important to us or personally meaningful to us are going to have very, very low thresholds, which means we'll be able to notice them or pay attention to them even when they're in the unattended channel or even when someone is talking about us all the way across the room, 
right? As opposed to other sorts of words that we don't really care about or that don't that aren't really important or relevant to us, those are going to have much much higher thresholds, um, meaning it's going to be much harder for uh, for our uh, attentional system to detect them. Okay, so this is basically um, kind of just reiterating what I was talking about before. Um, so again, the dictionary unit is going to associate a particular threshold with all of the words um, that we've been exposed to in our memory um, and words that are personally significant to us, such as our name, are going to have very, very low thresholds of activation, meaning that even when they pass through the filter at a very, very weak signal, okay, our attentional system is going to be able to detect them. Uh, in contrast to uh, words for objects that we don't really encounter a lot in daily life, uh, such as a rutabaga, right? Uh, for most of us, that's not really personally relevant or something that we would have to be predisposed to be able to detect in our environment. So that's going to have a very, very high threshold of activation, and we're not really likely to notice it unless it passes through our uh, attended channel at full strength, right? Whereas um, a boat, right, depending upon our personal life history, um, might have a, a low threshold or a high threshold or a mid middle of the road threshold, um, depending upon our life experiences, right? So if we're in the Navy, right, the word uh, boat might have a lot of personal significance associated with it, in which case it would have a much lower threshold. Right? And this is also kind of a common word that's frequently used in our lexicon. Um, so it's going to have a, a lower threshold than a low frequency word like rutabaga. Okay. What we have covered so far is we have reviewed uh, selective attention, uh, both the definition and some examples of selective, selective attention and how it can be distinguished between, uh, um, or how selective attention can be distinguished between executive attention. Um, we've also talked about how psychologists study selective attention. So we've talked about the particular paradigms that they use. Um, in this case, we've talked about experiments using the dichotic listening task. And lastly, we have reviewed the so-called filter models of attention. Right? So we started with the early selection model, uh, which proposed that uh, with selective attention, um, information from the unattended channel is filtered out based on their, uh, based on its physical characteristics alone, right? So it's not processed at all for meeting before it gets filtered out. And we contrasted that with the late selection model proposed by uh, Deutsch, Deutsch, and Norman, which proposed that uh, the unattended channel is processed both for its physical characteristics and for its higher level uh, characteristics like meaning uh, before being filtered out. Um, and the last model we talked about attempted to uh, preserve cognitive economy by suggesting that both the attended channel and the unattended channel pass through the filter, um, but only uh, information in the unattended channel is only passed through at a weak uh, strength relative to information in the attended channel, um, and only information that is of personal significance to the listener uh, will be easily detected by the attentional system. Okay, so that concludes our discussion of the filter models of selective attention. So in our next lecture, we will start talking about uh, various failures of attention. So we'll begin with uh, neuropsychological disorders that cause um, difficulties with attention. So we'll talk about uh, ADHD, 
and we'll also talk about uh, hemispatial neglect or visual neglect, which you guys are already uh, familiar with from our cognitive neuroscience uh, unit. Uh, and then we'll just basically review uh, what you already know about inattentional blindness and change blindness from the seven sense of memory lecture. Okay. All right. So I'll see you guys. I'll see you guys soon. Take care.